wrap up some of the concepts around factorial and factorial experiments. So we can talk about a final example and show you how to implement that. And then we move on to responsible standards, which is the next and final section of this today. So this is a quick capping of where we were last time. So we're looking at this table. This table is
with seven factors A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So A, B, and C were my, my three main factors. Then D was generated, E was generated, F was generated, and G was generated using those four generators on the table. So this matrix here then becomes my X matrix in R. That matrix of signs is my X matrix. There's an additional column for the intercept. You always have the intercept, which is a column of ones, or pluses, if you want. And then these seven additional columns. So eight experiments, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven slot coefficients plus an intercept, eight. Eight, eight experiments, eight parameters that can be estimated by the model. We went through the design pattern last time, so we won't go through that again, other than to just summarize that <laughs> the main effect A will be confounded with the other two factor interactions B, C, D, E, F, and G. Notice that in the D, E, and F coefficients, we see our confounding pattern uh, show our generator back up there. So we know that the generator D is the product of A and D, so we expect to see that there in the confounding pattern. <laughs> So in order to then get that, that Pareto plot, um, this code is posted on the website, so uh, no need to try and uh, get it down here. The way to do it is, as before, we say we generate our design, A, B, and C, because we've got eight experiments, we know we can fit three factors in a full factorial manner, so we use that expand of drift function we introduced several classes ago, and that will get you A, B, and C. So A, B, and C columns. So if I just run that code, so there's my A vector, my B vector, my C vector. Generate the other four columns manually. So create D, E, F, and G according to those generators from the table. So that will now generate D, E, F, and G for you. Assemble your Y vector of the eight responses in the same order. And then you can create your linear model over here. So say a linear model where y is described by a, b, c, d, e, f, and g. So there's my seven factors, my seven slope coefficients I'm going to estimate, plus the intercept automatically. So if I run that additional code, then I will get my model. And if I sum, use summary on the model, it gives me the, the regular R summary for it. So there's my intercept, my slope coefficients, and there's no degrees of freedom, which is why all the NAs are <coughs> Then the next step is to visualize those slope coefficients. So you can certainly use this output below here if you wanted to. It's quite easy to see which coefficients are the most important. Um, we can quickly see that B is unimportant, D and E are, and F are relatively unimportant compared to A and G and C seem to be by far the most important coefficients. But we, um, we can plot it in that Pareto plot, and that code is again on the, on the course website. We've used this one before. So just execute that, and you'll get this plot that's shown here on the other <coughs> side. So color coded here is C, A, and G on my negative coefficients, E, and E are positive coefficients. We must be clear, however, that these are not the pure coefficients of A. These are again color synthesized. This is not the field effect of A, this is A being found with good those other two factors. So quite quickly though, we see that B main effect is not important. F, D, and maybe even D can quickly be eliminated from my experiment. So let me show you how you can do that in R. Um, let's eliminate B, F, and D, those the smallest three coefficients first. So B, D, and F can be eliminated. So we simply create a new model where we set address y onto a plus c plus e plus g. So we simply just use the coefficients we want to retain in the model. And I will then run confidence on that updated model afterwards. Which then shows me that a there is significant, it's, it's bounds uh, do not include zero. C does not span zero. E, however, does span zero. So E was this coefficient that was a little bit unsure whether I should retain it or not. Its confidence interval does expand zero. So there's evidence there to show that it's not significant. And then G is, is significant. So here I can still choose to retain E or not. Um, I'm now at the point where I'm trading off statistical significance versus engineering significance. 
I would supplement my knowledge of the process on what factor E represented and choose whether I should retain that coefficient or not. It's not, it's not a clear kind of answer. Uh, and it never is in fact in statistics. So that's my updated model with G retained. If I want to, uh, sorry, with factor E retained, if I wanted to eliminate E, however, it's cool. the same procedure as before. Regress the model with A, C, and G <coughs> and drop into powers. So if I'm now down to a model with only those reduced coefficients, then what I have then is essentially a system where let's say if I remove B, D, and F, I choose that B, D, and F are not important, I now have four factors remaining. A, C, G, and B. So I've eliminated B, D, and F. I now have four, experiment, uh, four factors remaining. I've done eight experiments. That's equivalent to two to the two to the um, let's see, we've got four factors minus one. So it's equivalent to me having done a, fr a half fraction in four factors A, C, E, and G. So I have I've used this evidence from the model to eliminate B, D, and F. I know and I can confirm that those are not important. I now have four factors remaining. I've only done eight experiments. That would be the equivalent of having done a two to the four minus one factorial. Even though I never did that originally, I'm now down to that situation. Can I? So I've eliminated factor factor B, yes, and D and E by many factors. So you're concerned that G is confounded with with. Uh, B earlier on. So what I'm saying is back to B is not important, nor any of its other interactions. Okay, so when we, when we look at our confounding pattern up there, we're essentially saying, uh, and this is like some people have, have asked about it, when you look at your confounding pattern, let's take this confounding pattern over here, you see E is confounded with these other two factor interactions. Our usual assumption is that that coefficient is due to E and not due to factor interactions. We know in practice that it could be due to A, C, B, G, or D, F that makes that coefficient large. But our <coughs> assumption going into it is that it's the main effect that's large and that two factors, two factor interactions are small. That's the price we pay for compounds. Right? We have to accept a trade-off. And that trade-off is this inability to discriminate between the main effect and the factor <coughs> So when we say we delete the variable, yeah, we absolutely just simply take it out and say it, it was as if we never did the experiment with that factor in it at all. And as if I had done an experiment originally with only four factors, but as I've got that eight experiments is equivalent to the two to the four minus one. The interesting thing is that when you refit your model, your coefficients will never change. And why is that? If I rebuild this model with F, D, and B removed, these magnitudes of G, A, and B, these bars do not shift. I'll leave you to think about it. The question is in the final exam. So, so that's, um, that's, that's one uh, the approach to follow. Yeah? And so that code is posted on the course website to, to, um, to work through on your own examples. Then we, we ended off the, the class last week by just discussing projectivity. Projectivity tells us what is the magnitude of the full factorial that's embedded inside a fractional factorial, and we use that relationship there that as the resolution minus one. So here's an example uh, from, from a previous test or exam. I wasn't sure which, which it was. Essentially, what was happening here is that a company was developing a new product, okay? Again, new product development was trying out new procedures on the process, scale up, transfer from the lab to the to pilot, uh, pilot plant and pilot plant and full scale. These are great situations to be using fractional factorials. So when companies are developing new products, they will go through these factorial methods. And what they're doing here is they're really aiming to get a product with a stability value of 50 days or greater. Okay, so this could be a biological work, for example, or a biological product, or some sort of product that 
becomes unstable after a period of time. And they're hoping for a 50-day period or greater. Four factors have been investigated. They've done eight experiments, so it's a, a half fraction that's been done. The experiments in standard order were, were performed as follows, A, B, C, D, given over there with their low levels and high levels respectively, and there's the corresponding Y value. So you, you should be able to quickly answer these questions. How was the experiment originally generated? This is quite common. We're coming to companies where experimental work has been done, we need to try and figure out what the approach was used prior. So how did this person that ran the experiment originally, how did they generate that experiment? What was the defining relationship? What was confounded with what? What is the resolution of that design? And then to calculate that model's coefficients for intercept, the main effects, those two factor interactions. So that's something you should be able to uh, answer fairly quickly. You can obviously use R or um, by hand and calculate this least squares model to confirm your answers. But this is where we're going, this is now to introduce our next topic. We're going to build these least squares models on these systems and we're going to start to use them to try and optimize our process. If I'm looking for a stability value of 50 days or greater, what is this model telling me that I should do? What should, where should factor A be? Where should factor B, C, and D be? So there's my model. On the slides, on the previous page, tells you what A, B, C, and D are, and what the ranges were used in, in finding that least squares model. My question now is, where should this company run their next experiments to be most likely to get a stability value that exceeds 50? What should they do to their process to get that stability value? Okay. Take a look at it for a minute, talk with the person next to you, and, and plan what your strategy would be to get a stability value of 50 or higher. Of 40% will correspond to XA of 0. So anything below 
40% will be a negative polymer concentration. What should be the coefficient, uh, sorry, the XD? Positive or negative? <coughs> B is the acid concentration. Should we use low acid concentration or high acid concentration? Low. low. So this one is easy. Categorical variables usually are easier uh, to work with. We can only use low or high concentration acid. So a negative, a low acid concentration will give you a negative x, a negative times a negative will boost y incrementally as well. Catalyst limit. Catalyst level less than 2.5 will get you a negative XC. You can go lower than, than, uh, than the lowest limit. So we ran catalyst originally at 2% and 3%. So 2% corresponded to minus 1, 3% corresponded to plus 1, 2.5% corresponds to 0. But you're certainly not restricted to run between 2 and 3. You can go outside these bounds. Like this model that we built for the process does expand beyond the region to a limit. That's the whole idea I want you to start to appreciate in today's class. These models are not restricted to the region you did your experiment in. They are cause and effect models. You change the process, there was the cause, there was a corresponding effect. These are incredibly high quality causal models. They do work outside of the zone where you built them. So this mindset that you have, unfortunately, from prior courses that you can never extrapolate out of the moral region is rubbish. When you've got cause and effect, you absolutely can extrapolate to a point. The whole purpose of today's class is to understand what that point is. And then temperature. What can you do about temperature in this case? Temperature seems to have a very marginal effect relative to the effect of A, B, and C. These have a much stronger effect on the process. This 0.75 coefficient tells you that it's relatively insensitive to temperature. There's a small part of the coefficient there. So to boost stability, you should operate at least with a positive XD, so anything above the midpoint between those two values. So can you use that model though to guarantee and get a point exactly with stability of the percent. <laughs> but if you need a stability value exactly equals 50 percent, can you can you achieve that? What would you change? This is a trick question, yeah. Um, could you not change all the other in the US variables to try and offer But you can certainly adjust the continuous variables, the categorical variables you have to pick at one level or the other. But we've got three continuous variables, A, C, and E. So remove the ones that don't make a difference. Remove the ones that don't make a difference. Okay, so fix those at some values, perhaps. Change the cheapest one. But it's clear from this discussion that there's an infinite number of ways to get a value exactly equal to 30. There's not a single unique correct way of doing it. Certainly the way to do it though is to vary those variables that are the cheapest to adjust. And fixing the other categorical variables at a particular value. So this is where we move to this next section here where we're examining our processes and we're going to use this terminology in this whole area is called response surface methods. Response surface methods create a surface that models the response. The response is just another way of saying the y variable. So what is the shape of the y variable over the range of the, of the factors we're um, changing? And we want to understand what that shape of that surface is so that we can optimize it. Most of our processes, that y variable is incredibly meaningful for us. It's a profit, 
measure, measure or it's a measure of costs or it's a measure of quality. And so we really want to maximize it or minimize it in some way to get the best or optimal response. The key thing is we're not going to do this in one shot. We're going to always do this sequentially. There's no way we can get to that optimal in one step. I'm currently here at my base case in this situation with the right part of the section of the course. There's no way I can go from there directly to the optimum. This procedure we're going to look at today is a sequential approach. But you might be concerned that I said earlier, do not change your variables sequentially. So this changing one variables, one variable at a time, change one variable at a time, change one variable at a time is very much a sequential process. What we're looking at is not exactly that. We're going to do something that's a little bit different. When we change our variables, we're going to change them all simultaneously. So when we look at the cost approach, I said not to do that because that's inefficient. We're changing one variable at a time, and then another. What we're going to do is we're going to change our variables to get to that optimum. is pretty much all due to George Box. George Box passed away last week on Thursday. He was a great person, a great statistician. He is the person responsible for introducing responsive methods, but a number of other statistical tools are named after him as well. So you, you will come across his name if you ever get into data analysis and statistics. Uh, George Box was the PhD and master supervisor of Mike Fire Boss, John McGregor. And um, a number of other good students have worked under George Box, who are now also famous statisticians. But one thing he's most well known for is this quote, essentially all models are wrong, but they're useful. And that is the key, the really key point of the statistics course, as well as particularly response services methods. These models we're building, these least squares models, are wrong, they never match reality, but they're incredibly useful. They do serve a purpose of getting to an optimum, to a point. We, but that's the key. How do we know when these models become wrong and when we need to stop and rebuild our model? And so that's, that's really today's class is recognizing where to stop and where to rebuild the model. Let's take a look at it conceptually in a single variable case, which is something you will quite, quite readily understand. And then we'll look at the, the binary variable case, probably in today's class and tomorrow's class. Uh, yeah, tomorrow's class. So in the single variable case, this is how it goes. Let's consider my initial point of operation over here on this axis. So that's where I'm currently operating. Well, whatever this variable is, x1, might be temperature, might be pressure. It's just some parameter that we can adjust so that we get a response y. So this y value might be profit, it might be stability, it might be viscosity, something that's important to me to maximize or minimize. In this case, I hope to maximize. I'm currently operating this value of x1 and reading up horizontally onto that black curve, that's the value of that y variable. This x1. Now I will add that this black curve here is not known. We do not know this in practice. If we did know it in practice, I would immediately move my x value to this location and I would operate my process there and I would be making all the profit in the world. But we don't know that. But this is the purpose of this response of this strategy is how do we get from where we are to this optimum but without knowing the service, which we never know in practice. So this is the strategy for a single variable. For a single variable, it says operate at this point, but then move a little bit to the left, move a little bit to the right, operate at those two points for some period of time, and record your response y. So what I record is those values given by the black circles over there. The best model for two points is a straight line. So I draw a straight line through those two points, that blue line, tangential now to this true black line, that blue line is my response surface, or my estimate of my response surface, I should say. It's the best model I have for my process. And you can see that this blue model of my process, which is the black line, my process is in black, I don't know what my process does, 
but by blue line is a model of that process, pretty good model within the region of operation and even beyond the region of operation. So because I see my blue line has a slope going upward, it's clear I need to move my x in this direction if I want to maximize y. And that's exactly what I do. I take a step of gamma 1 units along this x-axis and I choose to go move my process operation to this location over here. So I operate there for a while. And I can predict, even before I go move over here, I can predict what my y variable will be. My y variable will be whatever the point is on this blue line corresponding to this x1 value. So not the black points, that's the true value that I will record later on when I go operate my process there. But prior to moving there, I could have predicted a y value at that blue location where my finger is. I go move my process there and I record my y value and I notice that that delta, that deviation between what I predicted and what I actually achieved is pretty small. Because that deviation is small, I am confident that my model of the process is a good model. My prediction error is small, means that my model is doing a good job. So, not knowing any better, I take another step in that direction. So, I move over now by an additional step. I make a prediction over here where the marker is, and that is the y value I expect at i equals 2. So my second iteration, I expect a y value over here where my blue marker is. When I go actually move my process there, however, I record a lower value. I record a value given by the black circle. So that deviation now is actually quite, quite a lot. I'm starting to recognize my model is breaking down. <coughs> because that deviation is large. It's at this point that ideally I should go fit a new model. I recognize that my model that I originally had, this blue line, is not adequate anymore. If I was smart about it, I would go and fit a spline through this point, this point, this point, and this point. I've got four data points. I could go fit a quadratic, or I could go fit a spline through those points as we learned about in 3 d and I could go then estimate a better model for that surface, a better blue line. But if I naively take another step, gamma 3 ahead, I will then essentially push myself in a far worse position. If I've gone over to gamma 3, I will predict the response y that's up there, right at the tip of the blue line. However, when I actually run my process and record the y value, I'll record this black point over here. That deviation is huge. Okay, and that's when I realized my model has broken down. I could have realized it over here and done something earlier about it, but instead I wasted an experiment and moved over here to this third iteration. So I would argue that that third iteration was, was wasteful. But let's say we did it. We ran our process over there. We recognized that I've predicted up here, when I run my process, I get a point over here. I'm like, oh no, my model that I originally had is totally off. This model <coughs> is totally, totally off. It's not valid anymore. I've recognized my model's usefulness was broken down. Well, what can I do about it? I rebuild my model. That's all I, all I can do. At my third iteration, I go rebuild my model. And I rebuild my model exactly how I did over here originally. I go and take my process where I'm operating and I run a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, record the y values, and I get a new model. A new model for my process again points me in that direction. So I recognize from this new model, the second new line, that now my process is operating in such a way that increasing x1 is not going to increase y anymore. In fact, it's the opposite. I have to decrease x1 in order to head towards my optimum this time. So then now I take a step backwards, gamma 4. It obviously makes no sense to take a step all the way back of the same magnitude as I took originally coming here. So I, 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 that's clear. So I need to take a smaller step now, and I will operate, choose to operate my process here. So this, is, this example here has all the characteristics of what we're going to do for multiple variables. 
characteristics are we're going to build a model, extrapolate, predict where we're going to be, check our prediction, is that error large or not large? The moment that prediction error becomes large, we rebuild the model. Also, we're going to start to notice that as we approach the optimum, we take slightly smaller and smaller steps. So this example is exactly in, in all the features that you're going to see in the multivariate case. So this is what's in your notes. Currently here, I just added these new points, uh, what I've just mentioned here. We're going to do the same with multiple variables. We're going to build a least squares model to optimize with. We're going to figure out or detect when that least squares model is inadequate. <coughs> Once it is detected as being inadequate, we're going to rebuild that least squares model with a new one. Okay. So here's, here's an analogy I want you to have in your mind before this. It's the equivalent of a blind person using a cane, walking around an environment that they've never been in before. We're doing exactly that. We're operating our process. We've never deviated from where we currently operate. We're going to climb the mountain or climb the terrain, climb the hill around me so that I can get to the optimum. Every time I use my cane to tap the surface around me, I'm doing an experiment. I'm doing a, a, an experiment, I put, put it down and I feel what the environment is like around me. Is it going up or down? Are there peaks or valleys? But the only thing is that every time we use this device of implementing an experiment, it's extremely expensive. We do not have the luxury of doing it often. So we need to make sure that where we choose to run those experiments are sensible locations that give us the greatest value for money. So here's an example. Um, I'm teaching reactor design at the moment. And in the project, uh, the students are optimizing temperature and pressure to get the highest yield. And this is one of, those, one of the particular response surfaces that are available for the projects that they're looking at. It's quite clear that temperature on this horizontal axis and pressure back into the bullet axis leads to an interesting surface of the yield of methanol. This is, this is actually quite common. Um, we see this in many processes, that many of our processes operate along the ridge, okay, indicating for us that there's a number of <coughs> optima. There's not a single optimum. Right? It's clear that I need to increase temperature. If I was on this side, I would need to increase temperature. If I started on this side, I would need to decrease temperature. But once I get up to this ridge, there's a whole band of optima that are pretty equivalent to each other. Um, some are slightly better than others, so there's a, there's a higher point over here than, say, down here. There's a bit of a, what we call a saddle. But that's exactly what we're going to use response surface methods for. We're going to figure out what this true profile looks like below us with maybe about 15, 20 experiments. And so this curve that I generated here was from a simulation, and I used about 1,000 simulations of the process to do it. We cannot do 1,000 experiments to generate what my surface looks like. We've only got a limited time and budget. Where do we put those discrete points on that surface to find what that shape looks like? So we're going to use this example in, the, in today's class and tomorrow's class to look at this. We're going to start investigating what is my profitability of the process. And I'm operating right here at the moment. So my current conditions of operation are at 325 Kelvin and at 0.75 grams per liter substrate concentration. Those are the two variables I have available to me that will affect the profitability of my process. At my current point of operation, I'm making a profit of about $407 a day. These contours shown here in dashed gray lines are not known to me. I'm putting them here for us as a teaching tool so that when we interpret this model, we can see that our interpretation is sensible. But in general, we do not know <coughs> any of that information that's shown in the so here's what we do. We're operating at our current baseline. We've identified two variables which are important to changing the profit of the process. Temperature and substrate concentration. The first step I do is to run a full factorial or a fractional factorial in those factors. 
So in this case, we've only got two variables, the full factorial with four terms. Pretty straightforward. We're going to look at it in conceptually what it would look like if you put three factors or four factors. We can still use the same procedure I'm going to show you now. And when you've got three factors or four factors, it makes more sense to do a fractional factor rather than a full factorial. But because we've only got two factors here, we do a full factorial. First question that everyone asks, how big should that factorial be? How far <coughs> to the left of my baseline and the right of my baseline in temperature should I go? And how far up and down in substrate concentration should I go? So all, all I know going into this is my, my base operation. I'm currently operating here. People are complaining that this is not enough profit. How far apart should these points be when putting down my factorial? The general guidance is if you know absolutely nothing about your process, about 25% of the range of that variable. But we almost always know more than that. So when we operate at this baseline, a true process that's been operating for a period of time has never operated exactly at 325 Kelvin and 0.75 grams per minute. It would be a very, very unusual process when that is the case. Almost always there will be previous experience of deviations from that point. Those deviations can be used if you go look up the data for those times when you did operate away from the baseline. You can go get a feel for by how much why your response changes when you're operating away from the baseline. The magnitude of, of that deviation gives you a good indication of how big a step size you should take. Other things that might be important to you are these constraints. So here I've shown the constraints at the lower bound and upper bound. Those variables might well be constrained, and in many processes they are. We, we know that, right? We can't just take our chemical plants or our production facilities and arbitrarily move them to extremely hot and cold temperatures or extremely low and high flow rates. Every variable in practice always has a bound of some sort, um, just from physical principles or from the, the instrumentation on our process or of the capacities of our pumps or our piping or our heat exchangers, we're always going to be bounded on all our variables. So once we have those bounds figured out, a good rule of thumb is to take a deviation of about 20 to 25 percent of those, knowing nothing else. But you may have some prior knowledge where someone in the past has moved the process around, even with one variable at a time, that gives you some good guidance on how sensitive your changes in Y with respect to the change in these factors. So here what the company has done is they've gone and chosen to run their factorial 10 Kelvin apart on the horizontal axis and 0.5 grams per liter apart on the vertical axis. So when they go run this experiment then, they've essentially got the factor S and T is my temperature variable, is my substrate variable, and this is at 0.5 grams per liter, this is at 1 gram per liter, this temperature is at 320 Kelvin, this is at 330 Kelvin. My baseline is right at the center, at the zero, zero point, and it is a profit of $407 a day. So, what we choose to do then is run our factorial at those corner points. So I'll call that experiment one, experiment two, experiment three, and experiment four, and I'll call this experiment zero. is 
experiment one, two, three, and four. So these are run in the standard order. This would be a correspond to T minus, plus, minus, plus, substrate minus, minus, plus, plus. These are encoded units. And then the corresponding responses are 193 for the first experiment. The second experiment, 310. The next one, 468. <coughs> and the final one, 571. So, as I always recommend people do, is let's add these responses onto my diagram of the process so that we can visualize what this quantum plot looks like. So the first one is 107, then 193 at 1, 1, the first experiment, 310, 468, and then 571. So a really good, a good technique to use when you're plotting these data out like this on a cube plot is to superimpose those contour plots for yourself. We proceed as follows. Let's start at any, we can start at any corner, but let's, I'll just start at 468 is over here. On this horizontal axis over here, 468 will be somewhere between 571 and 310. And in fact, we'll be closer to the top over here. And it's certainly going to be above my center point, which is 407. So what I can draw then is a contour line somewhere like around here. So this is likely it's going to be about 468 over here as well. <coughs> Using a, 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 you don't have to be accurate. It's just a rough linear calculation. And between 310 and 571, 470, 468 is going to be roughly that. We can follow the line for 407 as well. 407 is going to cross around right here and over there. 310 as well. You can estimate it's going to go somewhere over here. So quite quickly, we can get an estimate for what that contour looks like in this local region. And it's telling me if I want to go maximize profit, which direction should I move in? Top right, at which angle? 45. Perpendicular to contour lines. So the direction of steepest descent is called uh, the direction that goes perpendicular to the contour lines. So in this case, it's, it's almost, uh, almost 45 degrees, but not quite. We can take a slightly bigger step in S than we take in T. The effect of the substrate, we'll show numerically in a minute, is slightly greater than the effect of temperature. However, both must be increased to increase Y. So this is, that's my direction of steepest descent. So essentially what I've done here is I've found this direction from the baseline that I'm going to head into to go climb up that mountain. So I've only done four experiments, it's like this blind person tapping the cane down four times, and they use that information of the relative heights to judge the direction that's the steepest direction of the set to go climb up. So the first step we need to do though is to build that model. So I will uh, leave it to you to do this at home, and you, and you should. It's not intuitive. There's one efficiency that's going to be slightly different than what you would expect it to be an effort to set. That's because we've got five data points. We're using five, five experiments to estimate four slope coefficients. So you should prove to yourself that the best model you can build is y, e naught, x t, plus the interaction of xt and xs and prove to yourself then that that is y is equal to 390 plus 
255 xt plus 134 xs minus three and a half xt xs. This is important. This is something you must be able to do in about two, three minutes. Using the data on the table over there on the right, and you should be able to get that equation on the left or in no more than a little two. It is really, really a quick calculation because in doing this response surface methods in an exam is something you're going to have to build that model four or five times. Okay, so it's going something you must be quick at doing. So we'll resume that next class and we'll see where we're going to run our next experiment.